I'm Kim Sandberg. I am so excited to have with me today Varushka Zarate Thank you. of Pride and Joy Quilting. So, welcome. Thank you. I am delighted to be here with you, Kim. Oh, this is so much fun. So I've been really spoiled uh, the last few days. I've had Varushka along with some other awesome quilting friends in the studio, and we've been doing some fun training with the pro stitcher and doing all these things. And I've gotten to know Varushka a little better. And I'm just so excited because she is going to tell us about her quilting journey, what brought her to quilting, and how she has gotten to the point of making these absolutely <laughs> amazing quilts that I just look at and go, well, yeah, someday, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, will you send me a panel so I can just quilt it? <laughs> we'll Thanks, see. Kim. So tell us how you got into quilting. Well, it, the more I've gotten to know quilters, I'm mm -hmm. amazed by uh, their story into quilting. And oftentimes I've heard stories of, you know, my mother was into quilting mm -hmm. or people in my community were into quilting. Um, for me, I was looking for a solution to a problem. So um, we had our two baby boys. Uh -huh. One day I'm sitting there with my two children. My husband comes up to me and says, uh, Varushka, the closet is full of baby clothes that don't fit them anymore. Right. Um, and the clothes that do fit them, there's, there's no place to put them. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I can't give these baby clothes away, no. right? Because it's not like, uh, to someone else they're just hand-me-downs, but to mm. me, these pieces of cloth have meaning to them, mm -hmm. right? They have pieces of my life to them. Yeah. And so I thought, I have to find a way to, to do something with this. Right. And so I thought, you know, like, the, like many of us do, you go to online and find <laughs> solutions, right? And uh, first thing I ever Googled was what to do with baby clothes, okay. right? Or how to repurpose baby clothes. Uh -huh. And that was the beginning of my rabbit hole experience into quilting. Okay. And at the time, I, I didn't own a sewing machine. And I had briefly commented to my husband, I said, you know, I think I might make a quilt. And he was, he just kindly just kind of looked at me and uh, bless his heart on my first Mother's Day with both of my babies, he gifted me this QVC Singer sewing machine. <laughs> and, Wonderful. Um, at the time I had a one-year-old and a newborn, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't even open the box until a year later. Um, <sighs> so that was the beginning of my, uh, the genesis of my sewing experience. <laughs> So you had these baby clothes and just got a sewing machine and you're like, I am going to figure out a way to preserve the memory of these. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and my, you know what my thinking was, Kim? I thought, before I cut into these baby clothes, I have to know what I'm doing. Right. Right. Because yeah. it's not like if I mess up, which I was going to because you're learning a new mm -hmm. skill. Like I can go to the fabric store and get five yards of this precious baby clothes. No, 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 no. no. Especially, <laughs> they're small. They are small. Yeah. So you have these limited sections and these bizarrely shaped mm -hmm. sections, like when you cut the sleeves or the little legs. Yeah. Or, um, I, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was exaggerated to the point where I was even saving like their undies. You know, because. Oh. <laughs> Because they have like <laughs> Spider Man and you know, like, so I'm like, I'll just cut off the bottom part. <laughs> like, it was extreme. Oh it was gosh. extreme. So, like, I thought I have to know what I'm doing before yeah. I cut into these yeah. little micro sections, these large sections. sections. And, you know, an interesting thing happened yeah. where I started sewing because I, I needed a solution to a situation. Right. But this. And it truly was magical. This mm -hmm. magical thing began to unfold where um, there was this incredible give back that oh. I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And you're a mom, oh. right? And, mm -hmm. and at the time, I was, you know, for many years, I was working full time. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a licensed uh, therapist. At the time, I was working at University of California in the counseling psych department and working full time. Then I had my babies. Yeah. And I tried doing that part time. And I felt I was doing both wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And so my heart was really, I, I wanted to be at home. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. we gather that together as a family. We say, yeah, this is, this is good for us. Yeah. So I stay home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's this incredible thing about, and this is my experience, yeah. about motherhood, where you are continually pouring out of yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are limited things 
or at least I was really bad about pouring back in. Oh yeah. No, no, especially when you have these little people that completely dependent on you. They have to keep alive? To keep them alive. <laughs> yes. You have to feed like I... multiple times. <laughs> I got you there. I got you there. And so there's like this constant pouring out mm -hmm. of yourself that's mm -hmm. happening on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, all of that pouring out often feels unseen. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you have to show for it, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I need an award for keeping my two children alive, right? Yes. They're thriving. I did that, right? And at the time, you know, being a, a stay-at-home mother, oftentimes the parenting is single uh -huh. yeah. in, in many ways. Not mm -hmm. all, but, but in mm -hmm. many ways. That was my experience. And so what began as this uh, adventure, if you will, to find a solution to a problem unexpectedly began became this incredibly fulfilling thing mm -hmm. where you know and I know it sounds silly but at the end of the day after all of this unpredictability and spit up and throwing up and changing yes, and you yes. know I was lucky to eat a full meal that day uh -huh. or take a shower that week mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. like it, I knew if I put these two pieces of fabric underneath the sewing machine I had produced something yes tangible, tangible. <laughs> tangible mm -hmm. and beautiful and didn't require every energy and so it began to become this incredibly therapeutic thing and so I, I would put my children to bed mm -hmm. and then I would uh, put on my PJs which actually I was probably living in my PJs at the time <laughs> so I would just yeah. change it to my other PJs clean ones, uh, clean ones. <laughs> <laughs> and I would snuggle into bed and watch voraciously mm -hmm. any YouTube video I could get on any blog mm -hmm. and just soak it in yeah soak it in soak it in soak yeah. it in and I began to fall in love with the process of learning like that. not just the techniques which was impressive to me as a, as a you know kind of being thrown into the deep end not knowing anything about quilting mm -hmm. you think or you have these perceptions of what quilting might be true and you begin to realize there is such a breath and full spectrum of style, mm -hmm. approach, uh, 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 technique, uh, and even within the same technique, there's different uh, uh, ways of, of skinning the same cat, if you okay. will. And so it was, it became, it, it filled my, my heart mm -hmm. and it filled my brain. Um, so it, beca it became this incredibly stimulating thing where at the end of the day I was, I was doing that. So all of a sudden I was putting my babies to sleep earlier and earlier uh -huh. so that I could get <laughs> You know, to learning more and more about yeah. quilting. Yeah. Um, and that's how my journey began. Awesome. So how many quilts did you make out of the baby clothes? One. One. I, I, <laughs> you I still have it, <laughs> I'm assuming. So I am not, actually, that, the stack of baby clothes is only increasing. Of course. Uh, and in my fantasy, I think, well, one day I'll use all of those baby clothes. Yeah. But I still can't bring myself to to actually now when I buy my boys clothes I'm like I need to buy something that I know is quiltable <laughs> right because that fabric isn't quiltable I need to save it you're like no stretch knits <laughs> no stretch only knits. cotton no nylon Long. I love it oh that's fantastic yeah okay so you made your one quilt out of baby clothes and I made it for my husband of course right of course because that's Bless his heart. You always got to make the quilt for somebody, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, exactly. Okay, so I, I absolutely love that, like what brought it into you. And I really think a lot of people, um, a lot of other quilters out there can absolutely relate to that. Mm. It's that, yeah. It's the one thing you made at the end of the day that doesn't get undone. Doesn't yes. need to be done again tomorrow. Yeah. It's the one permanent thing, right? And you could build on it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It was like this adventure yeah. where it was, you know, join us tomorrow night. Yes. Where Vrushka will make scene? another block. <laughs> Well, I can make another block. Yeah, yeah. And 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 then I began to discover a community yeah. of uh -huh. quilters and mothers uh -huh. within my developmental phase in life uh -huh. that were experiencing something similar. And yeah. so there was there was this incredible connection mm -hmm. I was experiencing in, in in really an isolated chapter in your life where yes. motherhood can often feel unseen, mm -hmm. isolating. Yeah. I, I developed not only this thing that was incredibly fulfilling, but there's also this community mm -hmm. that I was beginning to find. So I was hooked from the beginning. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I love that. So what was project number two? So after that, 
I got into all the things. Okay. Right? Because yeah. all of uh -huh. a sudden you need to learn the about all, all of the stuff, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm a very, uh, uh, my personality is very structured. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I like order, which mm -hmm. makes sense with uh, foundation mm -hmm. paper piecing. Yeah. Because it's basically a big old jumbo uh -huh. uh, puzzle mm -hmm. with fabric. Um, so I began to, to enjoy all of the process of learning about the stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered, so one of the things that I fell in love with in the very beginning was jelly rolls. Oh, yeah. I thought they were the most <laughs> incredible, ingenious. I'm like, so for, well, how much are they, like 20 or 30 oh, yeah, bucks? Yeah, 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 somewhere right Is that, uh, It's mm -hmm. been a while. So, yeah. so between 20 or 30 bucks, you could get one two and a half inch strip, you know, strip of every single fabric in that coat. And not only that, I thought it was s very cute, oh, yeah. right? Oh yeah, yeah, no, they're, 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 uh -huh. they're so cute. Uh, right, they're like little pieces of fabric pie. Uh -huh. And and so I, I learned about jelly rolls, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you learn about pre-cuts, and mm -hmm. you can get, and so the fascination of learning the technique, Yeah. but it doesn't stop there. All of a sudden you learn about the stuff, mm -hmm. and then you learn about the gear. Yes. Right? Which eventually we'll talk about Handy Quilter yeah, and how yeah, I got yeah. into Handy Quilter. Yeah. So by then, I was only doing traditional piecing. Yeah. And you know, now that I do exclusively foundation paper piecing, I'm, I'm really glad that my introduction to quilting was with traditional practices. Mm -hmm. Because traditional practices really are about um, making sure that you are being diligent with the smallest of steps. Yes. Because the smallest of steps impact the next step. Right. And if you, uh, now, I'm no quill police, so, mm. oh. you know, you do things as you will. But for me, I found if I am diligent in every step, then I find that the end result is oh, yeah. impacted significantly. And so traditional quilting taught me that. Mm -hmm. Like in the very beginning, I remember, because Traditional quilting, it's make or break it with that quarter inch, right? right? Absolutely. <laughs> like your whole entire quilt yeah. is make or break with that quarter inch. Yep. And so in the very beginning, I remember I, I didn't really understand that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way you do, but you really don't. No. Um, so either my blocks were a quarter of an inch too big <laughs> or a quarter of an inch too small. Mm -hmm. So of course you cut down everything yeah. to the smallest block you have, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But then you are compromising points and all sorts of things just to make this, sure that the puzzle fit. But I began to discover that quilting, I mean, we call it a craft, but it really is an art. Oh. And yeah. it's an art that takes organization. Mm -hmm. It's an art that takes planning. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's strategic. Mm -hmm. It's uh, thoughtful because it's, um, there's an element of quilting that takes pre-thought. Yeah. Like you have to plan and map out. Yes. Whereas other art forms, for example, watercolor, which I've done in the past, you know, you just, it's kind of improvisational, if you mm -hmm. will, where you're just kind of, I mean, you start with something in mind, but it kind of develops as, as yeah. it goes. Quilting is not that. There's this planning, a strategizing, and, and a diligence that goes into it to be able to do something masterfully. Right. And so traditional quilting taught me that. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think so much of the market is very much traditional piecing, oh, for right? Sure. And we, you know, I come from a culture that so I'm 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 first American generation, mm -hmm. um, Latina. My 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 mom is Puerto Rican Cuban, my dad is from Mexico. Um, and so it, it wasn't a part of my growing up. So I, I didn't understand these ideas of traditional, modern, oh. you know, I, mm -hmm. all of it was just like Ooh. you walked into Disneyland and had never heard of it. And you're like, w this is heavenly to me. There was something about it, the, 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 the craft, the, 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 the process that just jived with my personality mm -hmm. and, and creative expression. And, and so I, I got into like the, you know, uh, learning as many videos as I could, mm -hmm. um, buying all the things. And so I did dozens of, yeah. of traditional quilts uh, with the aim of learning yeah. so I could tackle the baby clothes. And just the more I did, the more I was like, no, I, I need that fresh pattern, right? Or that I need that yeah. fresh uh, uh, fabric line. Yeah. Um, but I'm really glad I started there because yeah. it laid the foundation uh, of the discipline of yeah. doing things methodically yes. and executing in a way that is intentional. Mm -hmm. Because 
for me, I found if I slacked early on in mm -hmm. the process, then, then that would build to where the end, you could tell the execution wasn't as, as uh, successful as yeah. it could have been. Yeah. So, yeah, I've done dozens of traditional quilts. Although now I just, I just do foundation yeah. paper piecing. Yeah, foundation <laughs> paper piecing. So, so you did all of these awesome traditional quilts, which, you know, that's, that's what most of us do. So you'd like do a block that was repeated basically yeah. with like borders and like all that all that good normal traditional stuff you probably like start played with colors a little bit did that stuff so the the question is how did you go from that to this right so you know you, even and as designing you're, it yeah. yourself <laughs> right. not just making it right 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 you know even as you're sharing i'm i'm reflecting uh even the patterns that I would get early on were high detail. So mm -hmm. like I would do Elizabeth uh, Hartman, Hartman mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So actually the baby clothes one is her little penguins. Oh. So the sweaters <laughs> are my kids clothes. Okay, hopefully we have a picture of that we oh. can show here. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So all of the little sweaters of the penguins are my baby's clothes. Oh, so it's like they're wearing, uh -huh. you know, and so I had a taller one for my older boy yeah. and a smaller one for my little boy. And so I was, I, even now as I reflect back, I was drawn to more detailed, mm -hmm. even foundation paper, uh, traditional like, pieces. Traditional, yeah, because definitely Elizabeth Hartman patterns, there's a lot of pieces. I've made quite a few. I like that kind of thing too. I know exactly what you're talking about, but they are not like, oh, I'm gonna make a four patch. No, there, there is, you have to be okay with tediousness. Yeah. And, 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 and enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. Look, if you don't enjoy the process of tediousness, don't force yourself because yeah. it's then it's just not for you. Yeah. Um, and and that's okay because yeah. within quilting, there's just so many. What I recognized was that for me, I, I liked the tediousness because like that process. Yeah, because the end result was so fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So I was yep. like, I can get through doing these tiny, tiny squares because I I was invested in the end process. Right. So. Even my, even, and I did the teddy bear, uh -huh, right, with the uh -huh. glasses that was yeah, applique. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I was into all the little detail things, right? Um, so the way I got into foundation paper piecing was very much how I got into traditional quilting, which was I needed to find a solution to an idea, right? Okay. So my husband, bless his heart, has been the, the most incredible and supportive uh, a person in this journey. And actually, I, I, talk, I called him last night after we've been here in the Handy Quilter yeah. doing all these amazing things. And I told him, you know what, honey, I want you to know, I told this, the CFO and the CEO of, of Handy Quilter that I would not be here if it was not for you. Because right. he was the one that purchased my, my sewing, sewing machine, machine. right? Yeah. And in the beginning, Kim, I didn't know if I was going to like quilting. Right. Right? Because mm -hmm. I've done a lot of creative things. Mm -hmm. So even through grad school, because I was going to grad school, paying lots of student loans to do grad school, um, I was balancing it out with um, community college art classes. Oh. So paying zero dollars to do what I love <laughs> and paying uh, lots of massive, <laughs> massive amounts of student loans to do what I was going to do. And, and that was yeah. really because in my family, you know, being a first generation American, mm -hmm. the education was huge and the yes. idea of education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which we talked a little bit about how yeah. really often trade schools or, or just following your passion can be much, but as an immigrant child, it's, you know, you have to get an education that will pay for the bills. <laughs> so I was, I was going to grad school, doing all this heavy stuff, you know, you know, uh, diagnosing and DSM, yeah. all this heavy psychological things. And then as a palate cleanser, would take community college mm -hmm. courses um, in, you know, Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, improvisational art, where we would like get gunpowder on these huge pieces of, of of um, paper uh -huh. and out, outdoors of course and we would light the we, so we would set the gunpowder and then we would light it and then we would brush it off and then oh, wow. use that as so, so that's the first I've heard for quilting inspiration right like, along the journey there you go <laughs> so I had this create I've always been uh, mm -hmm. uh, dabbling in some sort of creative yeah. expression yes whether well, it was music so um what were we talking about? Oh, yes. Well, so, so yeah, what brought you Foundation this? paper piecing. So um, Traditional. So I didn't know if, I, that's where I was at. I didn't know if I was going to stick with it. Right. Right, because you kind of yeah. dabble in all oh, these yeah. different things. Absolutely. And sometimes you enjoy a certain craft at a certain season in your life. Correct. Right, mm -hmm. and 
then it was just me and my husband, no kids, I yeah. could do whatever I want, and so I would dabble between different things, between knitting, cross stitch, painting, watercolor, music. Um, so I didn't buy the things. Yeah. So my first sewing table was actually a door uh -huh. I had gotten at Home Depot, one of those like, uh, uh -huh. and, and wrapped, for. Uh -huh, wrapped it in fabric, uh -huh. put it on top of two filing cabinets, and that was my sewing table. Yeah. Unbeknownst to both of us, I became obsessed with quilting. Yes. <laughs> I didn't just like Found it. Found your passion. I really did. And so all of a sudden we needed to upgrade the table, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we needed to upgrade the machine. Mm -hmm. And then and then I couldn't finish my quilt tops. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tried doing a domestic and it just didn't fit yeah. me or my skill. And mm -hmm. there was something about trying to get on a domestic. Look, I looked at every single YouTube video on making sandwiches from spray basting mm -hmm. to fusible to pinning the hell out of the thing. Mm -hmm. And I could not successfully quilt on my domestic. Yeah. And, and that was okay. Yeah. But I was stacking up all of these quilts <laughs> that I couldn't do it. I couldn't give them away. I and couldn't. these were the traditional ones. These so. were the traditional okay. ones. Yeah. And so actually, I said to my husband, I need a long arm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I need a lot. I need, right? And bless his heart, he was so supportive. He's like, okay, which one do you want? Right? Yeah. And after doing a lot of research, and we can talk about this later, uh, I, I ended up investing, because it is an investment, mm -hmm. in an Amara. Yeah. And I'm so glad I did to this day. So the joke was, okay, what magical unicorn do you need now in your sewing room that's going to make it all better, right? And he's like, okay, you need the unicorn uh, sewing machine. Okay, fine. To the, my, yeah, yeah. my actual sewing machine is a tulip pink unicorn. Of course. <laughs> and then it was the, the long arm, right? So he's like, okay, and then you need the iron. Yes. And you need the yes. trinkets. And yes. So we had this joke, okay, what new uh, unicorn, magical unicorn is going to make all your sewing experience better? Yeah. So I thought... I'm going to make him a unicorn block. Yeah. Right? And so I go online uh -huh. and I researched unicorn blocks. Mm -hmm. And there were some that you could see were, were um, <coughs> traditionally pieced. Like mm -hmm. they were very linear, geometric. Yeah. yeah. But there was this other one that caught my eye. Oh. And the funny thing is, now that I reflect back, because all I knew was traditional piecing, mm -hmm. I thought it was traditionally pieced. Oh, of course. Yeah. Because you don't, you don't recognize for the technique it was. Yeah. Right, because you think, well, this is this is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious to see, you know, how I cut out the shapes oh. and sew them together. Mm -hmm. So, I download the pattern. Where's and it, I, so, what pattern was it? So, this was a unicorn block by Robbie Patterns. Okay. And I have a little picture of it. I can show. And the first indication that something was off was when you print the pattern. <laughs> right, because a traditional. Uh, Quilt pattern is typically yeah. like uh, eight and a half by eleven, folded in yeah, half. Yeah. Maybe you have two of those, yeah, right? Yeah. Maybe folded in half. Yeah. This was pages. Oh yeah. Like pages. The <laughs> pages kept printing out. With big pictures on it that you're like, what? Big shapes. Yeah. With dashes. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh, this is this is interesting. Hmm. I read. Uh huh. Right. And it was foundation paper piecing, and I thought, I can figure this out. Right? Okay. I mean, I figured out the other things. I can figure this out. Now, at the time, Kim, and I don't know if this is because, like, unlike now, mm -hmm. where there are lots of resources online, mm -hmm. there weren't that many back then on foundation paper pieces. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's because I'm looking more, like, my life now is foundation paper piecing, so I see more of mm -hmm. that. Or if it's more like the phenomenon of when you're buying a car and all of a sudden you see that car on the freeway everywhere, right? <laughs> But back then, there just there wasn't um, there weren't resources on, yeah. on on how to foundation paper piece successfully. Right. So I just dove in, mm -hmm. and when I say that I was not successful in the beginning, I am not under uh, I am not uh, exaggerating, because because I was approaching it through the lens of traditional pieces. Right. Yeah. And so halfway through this project, mm -hmm. I realized, oh, it's the same ingredients just put together differently, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because it's kind of like Mexican food. It's the, all the food is the same ingredients. Yeah. They're just composed differently, right? Right. right. I, I, there was halfway through this project where I thought, 
oh, this is just composed. To, so it's like traditional piecing, mm -hmm. except there's just a piece of paper on top. Right. Right. right? Yeah. And so if halfway through that pro project, it just clicked. I mean, before then, I was seam ripping like nobody's business. <laughs> but and and after that, it was like this is my thing. Yeah, I love everything about it. I love that. So that was your. I love. I love that it was literally a shiny unicorn <laughs> pattern that yes. like helped you find your your happy place with this. So, how many foundation paper piece patterns did you make of other designers? before you said, okay, wait, I have, because I, I know exactly what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me, I ran into a problem. I can't <laughs> find a pattern that I wanted. Am I right? Yeah, so I, it's 100, well, that's because you're, you, you, you know, you know. It's After, a problem with the solution. Yeah, yeah. After that, I was voraciously, yeah. like, sewing up anything I could find. Yeah. And, and what I liked about foundation paper piecing, that was kind of a wink to what I was already doing with traditional, mm -hmm. was I loved the precision you could have. That you could, there was no real limit to the kind of subject or composition you could create. Right. Because that, that would otherwise be a little more challenging with traditional piecing. Yeah. Now, reflecting back, I, I, I see why oftentimes uh, a quilters who want to do complex subjects use applique. Yeah. Because oh. with applique, right, there's this, um, there, there's room for uh, uh, adjustment along the way. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, if the shading of a face doesn't work, then you can just toss it, recut it, and it doesn't compromise the rest of the composition of the piece. Right. With foundation paper piecing, that's not the case. <laughs> all of, yeah, all of, you know, all I of do. the planning, the strategizing, the yeah. layout needs to happen before you mm -hmm. even get to sewing. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was voraciously sewing up anything I could I could find, and and along the way you begin at least my, how my brain works I begin to study mm -hmm. right yeah and I think maybe there's some of that's grad school where you're like you take sources right and you create your own paper right I'm gonna write a thesis <laughs> right 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 thesis on foundation paper piecing if anyone needs a thesis just because so. <laughs> I love quilting. Um, so you, you subconsciously you begin to kind of digest all of these different styles, all of these d different approaches, and you begin to see um, what patterns feel more successful to execute because it's tough when you design something in your head, mm -hmm. but you need to translate it in such a way that will help another person execute it successfully, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we all know, we've seen patterns that are uh, harder to achieve that than others. And so... Um, you know, after doing oh, tons of them, I thought, well, you know, what would it look like if I designed something? Now, funny enough, even when I was traditionally piecing, I played around with a little design. Yeah. And it was a very detailed, uh, sort of this <laughs> pixelated heart, right? Because you're dealing with squares. Yeah. And I'm like, writing instructions for this is a nightmare. Yeah. Right. Two and a half by one and a half. I'm like, no, I cannot. I cannot do the math. This is going to take forever. And so I abandoned that. Yeah. Right? Once I found foundation paper piecing, I found that you could do a lot with less. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, well, I'm going to try. Yeah. I'm going to try. And so while my babies were swimming or at the park, I would either on my iPad, I would pull up an image. <laughs> and my very first thing that I ever attempted to do was a heart which is easy right yeah. I mean, now we look at it but the the way I approached it was slicing it up like a puzzle right so I would draw a line uh -huh. right remove it uh -huh. and then keep drawing lines and see if it could fit because that's how foundation paper piecing right. happened mm -hmm. and I think I get a lot of questions at this point about design and I think is at the heart of it is having a, a, a very deep and uh, 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 holistic understanding of how layering works. Right. Because right. then you, you, it's difficult to construct a pattern that's successful for someone else to make Yeah. if that uh, understanding of layering isn't, isn't quite there. Mm -hmm. And so um, at first it was paper. Yeah. I would take a ruler and slash it up and cut it up and okay. see if I could put it back together. Okay. And after a while of doing that, I thought, well, I can maybe do this on a computer. <laughs> uh, yeah. At the time, I had experience with Adobe Illustrator, Adobe yeah. Photoshop, 
And so I began to dabble in that. And I probably spent a good year mm -hmm. drafting and drafting and throwing away and throwing away and drafting and drafting. Because with foundation paper piecing, uh, y you can check if a pattern will work mm -hmm. with just the paper. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah so yeah. so oftentimes the way I will I will uh, review or test a pattern is just printing it out and mm -hmm. assembling it. Yeah. And then in theory, the pieces should work when you sew yeah, them up. Yeah. <laughs> so do you actually sew the pieces of paper t together then to test it? No. What okay. I do is I just cut the seam allowance okay. on the paper. And then and just then, put it. And then I just it. assemble it. Okay. Right. And then I and I kind of see. Well, you know what? I think these two can be joined mm -hmm. because. The, the, the challenge, and I think we were speaking about this earlier, I found that where I made the errors where mm. were where you begin joining pieces together. Yeah. Uh-huh. So if yeah. there were, pe the larger the piece, the more successful we are in completing that one piece. Yeah. Because there's no joining. You know, you're yeah. just sewing Keep on. adding. Uh-huh. And, and to clarify, because there are many definitions of foundation paper pieces. Yes, yes. And many ways of approaching foundation paper piecing. So my definition of foundation paper piecing is you work from the back, mm -hmm. right? And you have a piece of paper with sew lines on it, mm -hmm. seam lines, and you stitch with the paper on top of the fabric mm -hmm. on the sew line. Right. And then you rip the paper out at the end. Right. Right. Now there are many techniques. Oh yeah. Freezer paper is wonderful for large uh, designs. I, I tend to not use that for very detailed pieces, but that's just, that's just me. Some people find success in it, but I, I rather, I don't want anything moving at all. So yeah. there's freezer paper technique. There's some folks that actually do foundation paper pieces, but work from the front. Right. I've seen some of those and I'm like, because I learned how to do it from the back. So Same. Yeah. Same. So um, a lot of the, of the planning can happen before you get to sewing. Yeah. And so I, I, I began to realize that I loved the tediousness of that. I love that you use that word because that's not like, I'm like, how can you explain something that you enjoy as tedious? But I get it because it's that process, right? Yeah, and, and by te well, I say tedious because it takes a, 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 a well, meticulous it's... focus yes. Yes. On, on a tiny, minute detail, <laughs> right? Um, that for me is not tedious. Yeah. It's actually enjoyable, but for others, it's it's it can often come off as something that's more challenging. Yes. So when I say tedious, I mean a meticulous focus on um, a very minute detail. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So I, I enjoyed that that tediousness <laughs> of 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 focusing on minute details in creating and constructing. Uh, uh, detailed composition of a subject. And that's the thing about FPP. Yeah. Like there's almost no subject that's limited. Oh, it's true. You, you can, can do almost, anything. Almost, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think you can do anything, but yeah. we'll just put in almost just to make sure. Oh. And some of the stuff that you've done. So let's talk about some of maybe your favorite patterns that you've designed. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, when I first started, you know, you start playing with subjects that are you're familiar with, like mm -hmm. flowers and hearts and yes. more more geometric shapes. But I think my heart, as a therapist, as someone who is is seeking things that inspire and empower, I was drawn to people. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up in a home where my mother learned English from listening to Audrey Hepburn movies. Black and white movies. And my dad learned English from listening to the Beatles. Oh, cool. And so I thought, you know, if I'm going to take the time mm -hmm. to draft something and then take the time to actually sew it up, be because, by the way, those are very two th different things. Yes, <laughs> How something are. looks on a computer oh. versus how it sews are two very different things. Yeah. Um, I thought, well, what do I want to make? Right? I, I love animals. I love nature. I love geometric shapes. Um, how can I put all of that together to create something that resonates with me? Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that came into my mind was Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, actually, Kim, when I was in my therapeutic practice, I often dealt with women's issues. So mm -hmm. women and, and in all sorts of uh, different stages in their developmental life, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, one of the exercises we would use is... Um, <clears throat> 
who are some of the people, either in your community, either in the public, that mm -hmm. you respect, that you admire, that you aspire to become, and whom you feel have a shared value to who you are as a person. So that was already a practice that we did. Okay. And I and Audrey Hepburn's amazing, right? Yeah. Growing oh, up. Yeah. I mean, incredible life. Incredible life. She yeah. was an unstandard beauty. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she left the height of her career to raise her two children yep. in a time when that was not very popular. Yeah. Um, even to get pregnant was yeah. not very popular. <laughs> yeah. And then she leaves all that and becomes a UNICEF ambassador in a time when that wasn't a very common practice. Yeah. So she's a, a, a remarkable human being. Yeah. And so I thought, what would it look like if I tried uh, doing Audrey Hepburn? And like myself, just jumping in the deep end, I go to portrait, right? <laughs> and oh my goodness, I, may, I spent months trying different uh, uh, photo references and it wasn't working, the positioning of the face, mm -hmm. uh, developing symmetry. It was very challenging working out some details on, on, on what uh, photo references are are uh, more successful than others, and there are okay. there there are some yeah. references that are more. Typically, if you have a face that's straight on, mm -hmm. it's more challenging. Oh yeah, because there is no face that is symmetrical. Right, right, right. But with quilting, you want symmetry. Right. Oh, it right? makes it easier to design, I'm sure. Yeah, because you just flip it over. Yeah, yeah. But any face that you have that is symmetrical on both sides feels off. Yeah. And the brain catches it, mm -hmm. right? The brain's like, mm. ah, something's. <laughs> it wants symmetry, but it also wants diversity because it understands right. that part of what makes us unique and part of what makes you Kim are your imperfections, exactly. are right, are your 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 uniquenesses, yeah. the things that vary in you. That's what makes you beautiful. Right, and. And I think that's very challenging to achieve with straight lines and thread. Uh, yeah. Right? I agree. <laughs> and so early on, I, I something clicked in me where I realized how the positioning of the face can actually assist in, in tackling a complex subject. So for example, even like this lion, yeah. his face is a little, it's a little turned. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So his face, it's not symmetrical. No, it's not. It is not. It, I mean, even... Like, this is the center line, but it's not the center of the quilt. Right. The brain says, yeah. oh, yeah, his face is turned just slightly. Slightly. And so what happens in our brain is, okay, I see that this eye is different than this eye, mm -hmm. but I get it because yeah. the face is turned. So right. something clicks in our brain regarding the positioning of a face. Okay. So, yeah, so I learned a whole, a whole bunch about... Um, what lent to a m more successful execution of a piece okay. um, by drafting and drafting and drafting and drafting. This is so, and it's not quilted yet. It's not, which is my handy quilter will be taking care of that okay. with my We're new pro stitcher. About that. <laughs> so tell us about this quilt. So this pattern, um, I was talking with a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and we were talking about everything that's kind of transpired after 2020, right? Because mm -hmm. the world changed, mm -hmm. like our lives completely changed. It, uh, in every possible way. And we were talking yeah. about how, um, in particular women, mothers, f you know, w we strive to s sort of continue on, to have mm -hmm. the sense of resiliency. And then she spoke about, you know, how do we develop a heart of a lion, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and I, w I was moved by that, mm -hmm. uh, by that. And I was like, you know, developing this, 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 this strong sense of, of fortitude. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a lion pattern. Now, there's lots of lion patterns oh, yeah. out in the world. So oh, I knew I, like I wanted something that was as intense as possible <laughs> without being scary, right? A lion's. Mm -hmm. So I wanted fierceness, uh -huh. but I also wanted um, fortitude. Okay. So this pattern is called the heart of a lion. Love it. And I feel very proud of this piece, and I'll tell you why, Kim. So this is a pattern. Yeah. Right, because oftentimes I'll do quilts, and I don't make patterns for them. No, no, they're they're, it's an it's a one time. Yeah, because all you know, some and you probably know this. Oftentimes, creating a pattern takes oh. longer yeah. than actually designing and sewing mm -hmm. it yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's some pieces. So this is a pattern, mm -hmm. and when I went to tackle the subject, I wanted to increase complexity as much as I could. 
but decrease the difficulty of executing and sewing it. Okay. okay. So, right? So okay. increasing complexity means making it look as detailed as possible. Right. Which, uh, yeah, check. Right? Definitely. So like this entire eye is yeah. very, so this has high complexity, yes. right? It's very detailed. Mm -hmm. But the way you reduce difficulty, mm -hmm. so in other words, the way I reduce uh, basically a sewist making a mistake mm -hmm. is by making the individual paper pieces as large as possible. Yeah. Because remember we oh, spoke yeah, about yeah. Yeah, we did. how the margin of error, and it happens too with, with traditional sewing, That's the true. margin of error happens when you sew stuff together. Right. Right? Yeah. When you join it. Not when you layer it. Yeah. But when you join it. Mm -hmm. And so th what I aimed to do here was how do I increase detail? Mm -hmm. How do I increase complex? Because it looks really detailed, oh, yeah, right? Very, it is very detailed. But it only has 21 foundation paper pieces. So it's kind of like when you go to the puzzle wow. section and the kids section has like this box only yeah. has 20, you know, 50 pieces and they're like yeah, really big, yeah, yeah. right? That's a lot easier to make and quicker to make mm -hmm. than like the 5,000. Oh, it's true. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> so the Joan of Arc would probably fall on the 5,000 puzzle piece. Uh, yeah, and uh, this, especially <laughs> just on size alone. Scale, yeah. It's, it's big, a big, it's a big 65 by So. This is only 21 pieces, and, and it's been very awesome to have people that want to learn foundation mm -hmm. paper piecing, and this has been their first piece. Oh, wow. And they do it, they, they feel uh, the pattern is simplified enough mm -hmm. uh, that they can achieve something like this. Wow. And, and, and do it successfully. Yeah. So um, this particular one has quite a bit of color, as you can see. It does. It has a lot of color. But we were talking yeah, about... Yeah, there's a trick here because I was like, is this one of the ones you use 70 different fabrics in? And you were like, no. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> So this, so I'm obsessed. My favorite line of fabric is, well, for solids, I use Bella Solids by Mona Fabrics, mm -hmm. right? I think they're the best, in my opinion. Next is V & Co's Ombre. Yeah. Right? So, yes. and the reason why I love V & Co Ombre is because within one yard of fabric... Oh, yeah you have the same color family, yeah, right? Because you can get two pinks and one is a little orangey mm -hmm. or one's a little green. Mm -hmm. You have the same color family, but you have a diversity of density of color and, and, and hue, mm -hmm. right? Value, sorry. Yeah. You have the same hue family, but you have different values, right? right? So mm -hmm. you have highs, mids, mm -hmm. lows, and mm -hmm. you can cut about five mm -hmm. different values within one yard. So like... Wow. All of this is one pink. It's all from one fabric. One fabric. That's, that's this, awesome. This, all these uh, uh, sort of burgundies are uh -huh. one. one. fabric. All these the greens blues, right here, I'm sure. The greens all the are blues. all one. So you're able to achieve depth mm -hmm. of design with like a quarter of a yard. Yeah. But just fussy cutting. Yeah. Well, not really fussy cutting, just cutting the, the yeah. strip out of certain sections. Yeah. Um, and then to kind of offset it, then I use solids, right? So mm -hmm. the black is solids and yeah. the white is solid. Yeah. Um, the pattern, the pattern itself comes with solid options, mm -hmm. and I actually have a kit that comes with solid options. But for folks that live internationally that want to be, you know, do things a little differently uh, or uh, more economical, the Inco Ombre is yeah. the way to. And actually. I use Vienco Ombre on the wings here as well. Okay, so this quilt, so what's the name of this quilt? So this quilt is called Metamorphosis. Okay. <laughs> so this I designed during a season that was challenging. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of, you know, you're going, um, you're not who you used to be. Mm -hmm. You're not really who you're going to become. You're kind of stuck in the darkness, yeah. right, of this transformation. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to play off of that. It kind of looks like a fairy, which I love, mm -hmm. fantasy and fairies and Disneyland and all that fun stuff. So I, I wanted to play off of that I idea. And actually something really cool about this, we were talking about QuiltCon earlier, is that a Canadian quilter mm -hmm. made my pattern, because this is also oh. a pattern, and she submitted it to QuiltCon. She did like a monarch. Uh -huh. And uh, she submitted it to QuiltCon. It was accepted into QuiltCon. It, it was hanging in my same category. Wow. So I'm walking down, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. She gave me proper credit at yeah, all yeah, the yeah. great yeah, things. Yeah. But that's my metamorphosis quilt. And, yeah. and it's the same where you can create quite a bit of depth and diversity mm -hmm. 
uh, with color choices without having to buy the red, the pink, the aqua, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is Vie and Co Ombre. And, and I often use solids in yeah. my patterns, and, and that's for a few reasons. One, I like a clean aesthetic mm -hmm. look. Um, but two, it, there are more practical applications. Oh, yeah. Where if you base a pattern based on a certain fabric line, once that fabric line goes out of print, yeah. oftentimes the patterns may suffer. Mm -hmm. But when you have solids, it's like, you know, it, it has a long, it's sort of evergreen. Yeah. The second thing I, I, I discovered was uh, there are a lot of international quilters. There are, yes. Right? Yes. We were talking Definitely. about that all over mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And they often don't have access to some of the amazing fabric lines we do. Yeah. And so, so, for example, if you have a solid that's like red, you can find some version of red in, in your town. Right. If you're in Norway, India, Australia, uh -huh. you can find some version of red yeah. or some version of green. Oh, yeah. And so I, I found it was more friendly overall. Um, but I like the use of solids. Now, there are some quilters that will take. Oh, there have been many quilters that have taken this and uh -huh. used it and used uh, pattern fabric. Oh, really? Wow. So they'll, the greens, uh -huh. they match the, the value, uh -huh. but then they use pattern fabric. Wow. And it just it oh, blows my mind. It. Yeah. Because I don't think that way. At this point, yeah. I'm always like solids. So when I see someone apply pattern fabric to these complex pieces, it just, it, it's the best. It's the absolute best. I love that. Yeah, so this is um, uh, Heart of a Lion, and that is Metamorphosis. Oh. One of the things that I like about the Metamorphosis, and, and, and I aim to do in the pattern, is um, customizable. Yeah. Um, so you're able to change the skin tone. You're able to change the hair tone. Mm -hmm. So I like that, and I often do that in some, in my uh, patterns. The ones that apply is to create the 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 customizable component so that it can match a reflection of who you are, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's your skin tone, your hair color, so that you you aren't feeling like you have to uh, create something that isn't an expression of yourself. So well, like w these kinds of things, I often aim to, to provide uh, color references for people that are diverse um, ethnically, mm -hmm. racially, mm -hmm. so that they can make uh, creations that are an expression of themselves. So that's also very important to me. I love that you do that because it allows people to put themselves into the quilt. Yeah, that's because beautiful. when you make a quilt, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You, yeah. Even if it's a pattern, it's an expression of who you are. Yeah. You are making decisions on how to construct this thing. Yes. Because I'm sure you've heard this where quilters are like, well, I'm, I'm not an artist because I follow a pattern. Uh, not true. <laughs> it's not true. You are making decisions along the way that are a reflection of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so if I can help assist that even a little bit, mm -hmm. then I feel it's a win-win for everyone. One question that I get asked a gazillion times is software, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Jacob, our cameraman here, I bet guessed this a whole lot, which is what kind of camera do you use? Yeah. Right? Or like, what software do you use? Mm -hmm. And and that's a legitimate question. It's a great question. Yeah. And and I think industry standards yeah. are uh, Adobe Illustrator, EQ8, great. Those are the ones I use. Um, I actually use a combination, but those are the ones I lean on heavily. But I want to say this because um, because I get it asked a lot. And I, and I think that the strongest uh, perspective is the following. If there's anyone who's like, hey, I, I have an idea I'd like to design, right? The key is what tool do you already have in your toolbox right. that you feel comfortable with, that you feel you already have some level of mastery in, and start there. Because I started with a pencil and paper. Yeah. Right, yeah. and I had taken some classes in uh, 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 c computerized and uh, and digitizing. design and digitizing. So I understood some basic elements. I'm no pro, uh, you know. I can't design super complex things at this point. Um, maybe with some refreshers on, on more things. But I had the basics where I felt I dominated the programs enough to be able to achieve what I wanted. Right. For example, there's this really great, and even we were talking about it yeah. with our other Handy Quilter ambassadors, They're, they use, some use Publisher. Yeah, yeah, they use all different kinds. Yeah, it, what was it, Publisher? Uh, um, Procreate. PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Making yes. pow uh, patterns on PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, Corel. Yeah. And Canva, yeah. and I think that's amazing because 
when you feel confident with a program that you feel you have a good handle on, then you have the tools you need. Right. You know, you know, I've, I, you know what, Kim, now that I'm thinking about it, I have met quite a few FPP designers who use CAD. Oh, I'm not surprised. Right, because yeah. CAD is this engineering. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's like 3D and like super, but it's what's in their tool belt already. So it's what they use, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, what I say is, these are the industry standards, mm -hmm. and um, and there's another program that I heard about, Affinity, which is like a cheaper version of Illustrator, but that's a whole other subject, <laughs> which I've been kind of dabbling in and kind of exploring yeah. and learning. But the whole point is, don't feel like you have to you know, learn to ride a bike when you never have. Yeah, yeah. You, well, and you don't, you don't, because you've already got a bike in your garage, doesn't mean you have to go buy a brand new bike to learn how to ride the bike you already have. Right. right? And, and if what you have is a scooter, yeah. and you can kill it on that scooter, ride the scooter, scooter, scooter. you get to the same destination, right? Exactly. And often got two wheels. Yeah. <laughs> It'll get me where I need to go. Um, and so this whole idea that you have to be what others are, yeah. right? Or, or you have to, st look, I didn't get here for a shot. No. Right? It took a lot of drafting and, uh -huh. and mistakes along the way. And, and I think that's key with learning anything mm -hmm. is prepare yourself to make mistakes. Yeah. Right? Like we have this saying with my babies. So I homeschool, I homeschool my two little boys. Uh, my pride and joy. Yeah. Uh, and we have the saying where I, mean, I learn from my mistakes. True. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, oh, no, I made this mistake. What can we learn from it? And I think if we give ourselves the grace to say, I'm learning something new mm -hmm. and I'm going to mess up, mm -hmm. then we can go over that speed bump instead oh, yeah. of be stopped by it. So. Totally. I love that. Okay, so I want to ask you about the quilt that I think a lot of our viewers are probably going to want to know about your Joan of Arc quilt. My Joan of Arc quilt, yes! So my Joan of what's Arc... The, what's the story behind that one? Yeah, so... Oh, the story. <laughs> so my... I'm gonna give you the real story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, please, please. Uh, my dad uh -huh. uh, passed away two weeks ago, and oh. um, he had been struggling with cancer for okay. many years. And as a first-generation American, mm -hmm. I, I was my daddy's daughter mm -hmm. in many ways. and. Uh, his story is one of, of overcoming adversity mm -hmm. in a most remarkable way. He is a man who came from uh, deep poverty mm -hmm. and discovered his freedom through education and came to the United States, became a minister, became a professor, traveled the world. This is a boy who didn't have shoes, who yeah. sold his blood to have enough plasma to buy a belt. Yeah, yeah. And he through uh, through incredible hard work. grace and uh, hard work, created incredible life for himself and for my family. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, it's very difficult dealing with anticipatory grief. Yeah, oh yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I already talked about how quilting is my therapy. Yeah. Oh. And you know, Angela Walters is, is brilliant in coming up with the saying because it's absolutely perfect. It's Sewing true. keeps me sane, oh, all true. that stuff. So oftentimes I would find that during certain chapters in my life, I would create things that would f reflect mm -hmm. where I was. And so, you know, the image of Joan of Arc is the image, and I'm not talking about political or religious because yeah. there's, oh, <laughs> there's a lot of that too when it comes to Joan, but just as a feminist sort of female archetype, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm drawn to this idea of a young girl who has a passionate love for something. Yeah who is walking into something that she knows will probably end poorly, oh. but walks in with armor mm -hmm. and walks in with light, right? If I start crying, forgive me. Well, it's, I'm already like getting chills here, so um, I'm prepared. So while I was, I was you know, processing what was uh, imminently about to happen, yeah. there was a part of me that wanted to embody Joan of Arc, right? right? Because oftentimes with daddy, you feel like the little girl, oh. right? And so there was a lot in my life at the time where I was guarding myself. I was armoring myself mm -hmm. to be able to withstand um, the inevitable. Yeah. And so Joan of Arc for me represents this, this, this idea of how do you have strength, perseverance, 
light in the midst of, of, of adversity. Mm -hmm. and, and so her image is actually referenced, uh, it's, it's um, uh, based on an on a engraving by Albert Lynch okay. from 1913. Okay. Um, artwork found in the public domain. And when I knew I wanted to work something uh, with Joan of Arc and the whole symbolism of what she represents as an archetype, and I loved his, his engraving, but I wanted this light source, right? Yeah, and yeah. oftentimes we see this sort of halo yeah, around yeah. saints, and she is a saint, yeah. uh, deemed by, by um, others. So I liked the idea of the sainthood, mm -hmm. but then I added this sword of light to her to her hand. Yeah. Now she doesn't have, she, and stories say she didn't carry a sword; she carried a banner. Mm -hmm. But I wanted that sort of juxtaposition between the light from behind, which is, you know, love for some passionate love for something, mm -hmm. um, and yet this armor that guards you, yeah. guards your tenderness, guards your heart, mm -hmm. and then sort of the fierceness of a sword of light. Yeah, and and I think a lot of that was my own grief, you know, processing itself through the archetype of an incredible symbol. Um, and so I, I wanted these light sources of the, of, the, of, the, of the halo with the light sword to reflect off the armor. Mm -hmm. And so that was the inspiration of Joan of Arc. Yeah, That's pretty incredible. and I actually never shared that with anybody other than oh, you. Well, <laughs> no, I and all of you. A lot of people. A lot of people. My yeah, God, but I love that a beautiful that story. juxtaposition of inspiration of of light sources, mm -hmm. right? One that appears to be so t tranquil and so uh, you know uh, um, uh, calm, mm -hmm. dove-like, and the other being very fierce. Yeah, but both marrying into the reflection found in the armor. So yeah. I, I liked that idea as well. Oh, well, it's, it's such an incredible quilt. It's such an incredible Thanks, quilt. Thanks, Karen. So any other quilts you want to share about in your, in your quilting journey? We have, we have time to talk about one more quilt. So I would say that to this point, my most special quilt is my Pride and Joy quilt. OK. So that quilt, I, it started as with the idea of a self-portrait, right? right? Right. And I began to think about, okay, what are the things that define who I am? Like, if you do a self-portrait, how, how do you do that? Because, you know, do you just do your face? Do yeah. Like, what? So I, I, I got to thinking about what are the things that define who I am at this chapter in my life. And my two little boys, Rocky and Hockey, uh, Rock and Hawk, uh, are, this, are, the, are the sun to my planet. Uh, they are the definition of who I am. They are my pride and joy, yeah. which is what pride and joy is about. And I cannot get unteary when talking about <laughs> my two babies, my two miracle babies, actually. So I thought, well, at this chapter in my life, they are uh, my nucleus. Yeah. So I knew that a self-portrait had to include them in it. Um, but what was cute was after I finished it, my husband goes, hey, that's a family portrait. Where am I? And I felt so bad. And I'm like, no, it's not a family portrait. You're the one taking the picture. <laughs> that's what I always tell my husband. So, so I added like a wedding ring to my family. I'm like, look, you're here. You're not gone. I felt, I'm like, one day I'm going to do a whole, that'll take me ages, but I'm going to do it. So, you know, it, it was it started off as a self-portrait. It uh -huh. quickly became a triple portrait. Yeah. And so that's been the most challenging to, that was very challenging to design. Mm -hmm. um, it took me whew, three, four months just to draft, because I would draft and then I would throw it away. Yeah. And then you would draft and I would throw it away. And I would draft and find one section that I liked and kind of kept that and then would work on another. And so it took me a long time. And one of the challenges of that particular quilt was with FPP, you, you base the scale of the piece based on the smallest possible piece you can sew. Okay. Okay. So, for example, in this lion quilt, uh -huh. the smallest possible piece is that. Yeah, these little. So, based on that uh, re catch in the eye, that okay. reflection, then I can go in and decide what, how doable is to sew this. Right. Okay. And so in my Pride and Joy quilt, the smallest possible fabric shape 
was the, the, the line in between my teeth. <laughs> so I, I had to draft it and though no, that's too small, I can't sew that. That's impossible. Yeah. That's like the line of a thread. Yeah. To, so I kept blowing it up. So that piece ended up being 70 by 70. Okay. So it's finished. It's, not, finished. Not the line in between your not teeth. Not the line in between my teeth. No, no, no. <laughs> Although I had big teeth there. No, it wasn't the line between my teeth. Now, the funny thing uh, uh, about portraits is that teeth are very hard to sew. And I actually recommend that you don't get uh, image sources mm -hmm. that have teeth in them. Yes, because you have these very small structures that need to be sewn together. Yeah. So it's tricky. And the funny thing is that all three of us, uh -huh. number one, are facing forward, which I told you we shouldn't be, yeah. which I broke my rule in that one. And second is we all have teeth. Yeah. We're all like smiling. smiling. So um, after I finished that quilt, I, I thought, well, I haven't submitted to a show. Yeah. I'll submit it to QuiltCon. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm only going to submit this one if it gets in great, if it doesn't, great, right? Yeah. It's, it's my heart on a plate, basically. Yeah. And, and it's tough when you submit to a show. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you feel like I, I'm well, you're putting it out there for others to judge. Literally judge. Literally judge. <laughs> yeah. And say, well, this is good or it's not. Yeah. Even though our value is, does not lie in the judgment of others. It friends. does. No. Well, in, in our quilts, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. <laughs> um, we have our heart on our sleeves. Yeah. Literally. So I thought, well, I'll submit this one quilt. Yeah. And we'll see how it goes. And um, I was teaching at QuiltCon that year. Yeah. I was teaching uh, foundation paper piecing fundamentals, mm -hmm. which I'll plug. I have a little online course if you want to learn foundation paper piecing. Yeah. Um, on your website, which on is? On my website, prideandjoyquilting.com. Exactly. <laughs> Shameless plug. Um, so I was going to teach that class mm -hmm. at QuiltCon. I submitted my quilt. And... Um, it won first place in piecing, but you know what? The first place in piecing was awesome, but also winning People's Choice. The People's Choice was, was pretty special. Yeah. Because that yeah. meant that people in the quilting community who love modern quilting said, this is my fave. Yeah. And that was very, very special. Yeah. Very special. I'll never forget when Elizabeth, the, the director of QuiltCon, called me and said, we can call it. Like, the show hadn't even ended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, you're so far ahead that we can oh, call it. Wow. So I actually left with her telling me I had won, even though voting hadn't closed. Oh, my gosh. So that quilt is, is the most special to me. Yeah. And, and so the front is all solids. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, when there's a solid piece, when I have solids in the front, I like to use a pattern fabric in the mm -hmm. back. And it's same with my Joan of Arc. Yeah. So the Joan of Arc, all solids in the front, but the back is stained glass windows. Yeah. And then the border is actually, so I want, I love this, this, this thing about juxtaposition, oh, yeah. right? Two things that usually don't go together. Mm -hmm. So I have stained glass window in the back. And then the binding mm -hmm. is this minimalist, nevertheless, she persisted. So I did the same thing with my Pride and Joy quilt, uh -huh. where the backing is, uh, uh, I think it's by Art Gallery Fabrics, ice cream cones. Mm -hmm. and, and so the back is ice cream cones, because who's sad when you're eating ice cream? Right. right? It's like our favorite activity to do with kids. And then the binding is by Riley, uh, Riley Blake, mm -hmm. and it's X's and O's, hearts and kisses, hugs and kisses all around the quilt. Yeah. So that's my, that's my favorite. I love that. Well, and it's such a, uh, what an accomplishment, but also to have, like you said, to have the people's choice. I know that I remember just seeing pictures. I wasn't at QuiltCon that year, but um, I was just, I was very touched in the connection and thinking about my own kids and, and it was, it was beautiful. Thank so. you, friend. <laughs> well, it was so good. So good. I'm so impressed that neither one of us cried when we talked. About yeah. That. That was very good. So. Well, it has been so wonderful to just sit and chat with you today. Thank I've just been you, like, Kim. oh my gosh, I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> so wonderful. I uh, thank you so much for bringing these beautiful quilts here to share with us. Thank you. And as as you mentioned, there's, uh, you know, if you want to find out more about Vershka, you can visit her at prideandjoyquilting.com and look at all of her amazing patterns and see what she's done, her pictures. She's just such an amazing quilter. And I, I, I love that I feel like I've got to have a chance to visit with you 
kind of early on in your quilting career. And I'm yes. hoping maybe down the road we can revisit at some point and see where you are as you're continuing your quilting journey. So It would be an honor to have a full circle, a, a double full circle here at Handy yeah, Quilter. I, I know, exactly. <laughs> We've got lots of history. Yes, we do. Well, thanks for watching. Be sure to give us a like and subscribe for more great quilting content. And have fun quilting. Thank you.